Good evening. I'm Dr. Roman Hooker, Curator of Rare Books and Manuscripts at the Walt Disney Museum in Baltimore. And tonight, we're going to talk about some smelly books. So, books. They're perhaps one of the most multi-sensory objects in our lives. Our eyes read the words and study the images. Our ears hear the gentle rustle of the pages as our fingers turn them. We feel the velvety parchment or the weave of laid paper in our fingers. And at times of devotion, we might even kiss an image or a word. But I think many of you would agree that the most sensual and enchanting quality of a book has to be its smell. <sighs> there is truly nothing on earth quite like the smell of an old book. It's often said that our sense of smell is one of the strongest memory triggers we possess. Even the faintest trace of something familiar can conjure up in intense nostalgia or a sense of place, often before our ears or our eyes even register the connection. The owner of this well-worn book from 1816 inscribed his observations about this very phenomenon inside the cover, musing wistfully that this is one of my old school books. Whenever I open the smoky pages, it reminds me of my schoolboy days. Many wonderfully pungent books grace the shelves of my home's Victorian library, where I'm speaking to you today. Although my personal library has nothing of the rare books and manuscripts that I usually oversee at the Walters Art Museum, the air is infused with the same sweet scent as my grandfather's 19th century version of Shakespeare stands in for the Walters first folio from 1623. Indeed, just catching a whiff of a dusty, musky tome is akin to returning to my grandfather's study, momentarily crossing time and space to one of the most formative places of my childhood. Although the books themselves are nothing particularly remarkable in here, their very presence and their distinctive scent have brought me an immense amount of comfort during this difficult time. In the words of the immortal Ray Bradbury, if a book is new, it smells great. If a book is old, it smells even better. It smells like ancient Egypt. A book has got to smell. A book smell can vary greatly depending on if it's old or new, paper or parchment. Parchment, the most common material for books in the medieval era, was made from the hides of cows, sheep, and goats, and was the final product of a messy, smelly process of soaking, scraping, and stretching the skin. The resulting smooth, supple parchment retained the earthy smell of organic material, quite different than that associated with the old paper books. This skin, much like our own, had little odor unless it came into contact with something pungent, just as our skin might retain the smell of garlic when we've been chopping it. Parchment manuscripts can drastically be affected by the environment in which they are used. The membrane absorbing the smoke of candles or the mustiness of a dank, dark building. These traces can be, become a powerful aspect of the experience when using these manuscripts. Their fragrance stimulating special associations and memories within the minds of their medieval users. Sterile modern storage can often mitigate lingering odors and prevent newer books from absorbing them. But there are others. Books that stubbornly retain the olfactory imprint of their history that I affectionately refer to as the smelly books. Smelly books are the best books. They have seen things, and they tell us their story not just through the written words on their pages, but through engaging our senses in a silent communion. Bradbury speaks of old books evoking ancient Egypt, and he is in some ways not actually that far off. The most wonderfully odiferous odiferous of all of the books I have encountered at the Walters are the Ethiopian manuscripts. This is true, for instance, of the museum's famous Gundagunde Gospels, but two of one, our early Ethiopian liturgical manuscripts all retain the smell of the altar, a remarkable mix of candle smoke and the sweet spice of incense. One could recognize <clears throat> their distinctive smell blindfolded, and it is this heavy fragrance shared by no other group of manuscripts in our collection that makes them some of my favorites. The moment their book boxes are open, their scents waft into the air. 
But I've long found this perplexing, as many of our other manuscripts in the collection have regularly been accompanied by incense during religious services, yet they retain no noticeable trace of fragrance. In puzzling this over with my colleague Abigail Quant, head of book and paper conservation at the Walters, she suggested that the scent may be linked to something distinctive about the parchment itself. Unlike many other traditions, where animal skins were soaked in a lime solution to loosen the hair from the skin, and were also treated with chalk during the stretching process to help remove the grease, Ethiopian goat skins were soaked solely in water. Therefore, oils would usually have been, that would usually have been stripped from the skins are retained in Ethiopian parchment, and Abigail suggests it's possible that those residual oils might combine chemically with the smoke from religious rituals over centuries and allow them to linger long after the book has fallen out of use. It is notable that not all Ethiopian parchment smells smoky. Works made for the tourist trade, for instance, might have little to no smell. So it's not something inherent in the parchment, but rather a sensory imprint of use. Many scripts such as gospel books were used on altars in rock-hewn churches, where the continuous burning of candles and incense, such as frankincense, created an atmosphere in which the manuscripts were saturated in the smell of smoke and spice. This distinctive fragrance seems to be part of an unbroken tradition, forming an aromatic bridge between the medieval past and the modern world. For several years ago, when I was teaching a class at the museum, an Ethiopian student in the group caught the scent of our manuscript and exclaimed in an odd, hushed tone, it smells like church. This scent has become as integral to these books' cultural identities as are their rich illuminations and unique calligraphy. They are not, however, alone in retaining a captivating and recognizable scent. The famous manuscripts of Timbuktu apparently also carry a distinctive and remarkable fragrance. Abdel Hadara, who led the underground recovery mission to rescue 350,000 of them from jihadists in 2012, noted with humor that when he first began his career working closely with these kinds of books, his friends teased him that he always smelled like manuscripts. What's remarkable here is that the scent was so distinct and carried such strong associations that his acquaintances, who were presumably not all experts in books themselves, recognized that he smelled specifically of manuscripts. But not all books, however, retain quite such a charming aroma. With some books, their lingering scent alerts us to the nearly tragic loss. The Walter's only Syriac manuscript as well as one of our Byzantine Psalters, still smell of the fires that once threatened to destroy them. Their singed flesh darkened and curling from the flames. This smell, while distressing due to its history, is not necessarily unpleasant, but there are some books that have perhaps been even through worse ordeals, doomed to be stinky books by a cruel twist of fate. Take, for instance, this German manuscript created in 1420 and housed today in the Cologne archive. One fateful night, its scribe left his newly penned pages open to dry in the cool evening air, only to find the next morning that a cat, or make it cats, had used his painstaking work as a convenient litter box. Our woeful and vexed scribe set an eternal curse upon the cat, preserving the dastardly deed for posterity through masterful word and image. Here we see the spot of the defilement, complete with the offending cat and a scribe's wagging finger as his inscription chastises the dastardly beast. Here is nothing missing, but a cat urinated on this during a certain night. Cursed be the pesty cat that urinated over this book during the night, and because of it, many others too. And beware well not to leave open books at night where cats can come. I have not been to Cologne to check to see if the aroma has faded by now, but anyone who has ever owned a cat will know that six centuries may not be quite enough. One feels for the users of this book long after our flustered scribe finished his work and moved on. And it's hard to imagine that anyone wished to linger over it for too long. At least you can be sure that it was probably never checked out of the monastic library past its due date. This battle between scribe and cat must have been even more common than we would expect, as one of the Walter's own manuscripts narrowly escaped such a fate. 
Although we can be sure that angry words were uttered during this book's making as well. So parchment therefore is something of a chameleon taking on the sense that saturate it through atmospheric or physical exposure. It does not smell the same as that 19th century copy of Dickens or Poe you might have sitting on your shelf for the simple reason that it is not composed of the same materials. That doesn't mean that paper books necessarily lack evocative sense of their own. Famous examples include traces of pipe tobacco detected on a book handwritten by C.S. Lewis at the Bodleian Library and also on a book owned by T.E. Lawrence, known as Lawrence of Arabia, preserved today in the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas. Less famously, my grandmother's cookbooks still smell like her kitchen. Old printed books can therefore absorb, absorb scents from their environments just as much as parchment manuscripts could, but they are different in that they have an inherent smell. Most people are familiar with that scent, but less realize that their lovely, cozy aroma is in fact a result of deterioration of the book. With the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th and early 19th century, more chemicals and shortcuts were introduced into the manufacture of books, allowing for them to be easier to produce and less expensive. The result, however, was a less stable quality of paper pages and leather bindings. Unlike parchment manuscripts in earlier books made of laid paper, 19th century books were increasingly made from acidic wood pulp. As this unstable paper breaks down, it combines with the chemicals, inks, and glues used to make the book and its binding, which together emit a bevy of volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, not unlike the off-gassing of a car's interior that gives it sort of that new car smell. But it is this smell, the smell of the book essentially dying, that we associate with old books today. Despite the rather distressing reason for the scent that we love, its appeal has to do with the various compounds found in this VOC cocktail. These include benzaldehyde, which smells like almonds, vanillin, which you guessed smells like vanilla, and ethyl benzene and ethyl hexanol, which give off sweet floral scents. Taken together, it's no wonder that we think old books smell wonderful. There may, however, be another reason why we find the smell of old books so intoxicating. Studies of the fungus that typically grows in old books have revealed that they likely produce hallucinogenic spores. So perhaps that euphoria we feel while we're sitting with our nose in a good book or inhaling deeply as we step into an old library is on some level chemically produced. So no matter what the reason, there's little denying that the smell of a book that is cherished by all. There's even a newly coined term that is supposed to evoke this exact scent and it's called biblicor. And they define it as the comforting, faint and musty smell of old books. But when I go to pick up my copy of Jane Eyre today and take a nice whiff of my Kendall, <sighs> plastic. So with the advent of the digital book, we've cheated ourselves out of that special sensation, that olfactory aspect of reading that we took for granted. For one of the senses to be deprived of an expected activation can be jarring and off-putting, taking some aspect of the pleasure out of reading a book that we may not have even registered that mattered to us until it was gone. That this loss has not gone unnoticed is clear from the abundance of products that people have created to try to fill that very real void. When Kindles first became popular, you could actually buy a book scented freshener to attach to it. Or today, you can cozy up with your digital Dickens and burn a soy candle that evokes old books, replicating the sense of leather bindings and aged paper. But why stop there when you too can smell like those books that you love so much? According to one artisan soap called Leather Bound Book, it's quote, strong notes of leather and crisp paper wrapped in a subtle musty sweetness will recall your favorite bookstore or old library. And if you want something less subtle, try library lip balm or spritz with a book scented perfume oil. So while these products are kind of a bit quirky, the sheer abundance of them points up a growing desire to preserve that special smell and an increased awareness of its potential loss from our regular lives. 
These concerns have been felt in the scholarly, scholarly community as well. In 2017, Cecilia Bembe Bray focused her doctorate work at the University College London on devising ways to chemically record and catalog the smells of historic objects and sites in her Smell of Heritage project. Her work included libraries such as that of St. Paul's Cathedral, and her main method involved using carbon, fil carbon fibers to capture VOCs, such as those given off by old books. From there, she put the samples through a machine that identified the composition of that particular scent. The result was a scientific breakdown of how historic artifacts and locations smell, and essentially a recipe that will allow their unique fragrances to be documented and even recreated. And this fall, Oxford University's Bodleian Library is planning to open an exhibition called Sens Sensational Books, in which they have applied a similar approach to their own collection working with the Institute for Digital Archaeology to capture and share the sense of their most wonderfully odiferous books and manuscripts, including legendary works such as the Magna Carta of 1217. Thus, it is remarkably now possible to preserve and share the distinctive sense of some of the world's most unique books. It's wonderful to imagine that we might one day be able to capture the special fragrances of books on the Walter shelves this way and perhaps eventually even those we cherish in our everyday lives as well. Smelly books are like time capsules, keepers of memory and meaning that we unlock with our mind and our senses. What a gift it would be to preserve and safeguard those tantalizing traces of the past before they fade away forever. Thank you so much for listening. I am very happy to take any questions or thoughts at this point. Let's see, can you link any scholarly articles on the sport? Oh, yes, I can um, I can definitely pull those and we can um, include those here. It's actually really fascinating. I had no idea that that was even a possibility and it makes a lot of sense because I love smelling my old books, so. Any other questions? I'm looking in the comments, let's see. Ah, the musty smell of earlier 20th century books. Um, so it really does come down to the same sort of chemical breakdown is my understanding. It's the paper and the bindings and everything breaking down. Um, you know, and also a lot of people don't uh, store books perfectly. And so um, they are really susceptible to moisture and things like that. So a lot of times, a book might have been stored somewhere where um, you know there's humidity and it kind of gets into it and it might actually start creating some of these uh, spores in the books. Um, often they have some mold going on. What are the strangest animals used to make parchment? That's a great question. Um, I've seen a parchmenter try to uh, make parchment out of a squirrel. Uh, doesn't work very well, but um, but he was able to stretch it like they would do in, in medieval manuscripts. Um, I have heard of parchment made out of humans. Uh, not very common, but it does actually, there are a few cases of that in some collections. We don't have any of the Walters to my knowledge, but you never know. Any other questions? Uh, let's see. Can different types of storage change the smell of a book? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, the storage I think is is crucial to, uh, you know, protecting a book from absorbing the smells around it. Like if it is, you know, in a box correctly, um, you know, we have special boxes for our, our manuscripts at the Walters. Um, that are meant to kind of seal them in and and keep them from, you know, being susceptible to the atmosphere around them. Um, so yeah, I think 
I, don't, I think it can preserve the smell of the book inside. Like a lot of times our book boxes, when you open the book box, you can smell what the book smells like very quickly when you open the box and it kind of keeps the smell in. Um, but I don't know that storing it that way will actually change the smell of the book. It mostly sort of keeps it in. But I'm also not a conservator. So, um, you know, some people might have other experiences. How did I get interested in this topic? So this, this topic, um, we actually had an exhibition at the Walters Art Museum um, several years ago, um, the Senses exhibition, which was about medieval uh, art and sort of the different sensory aspects to that. And so um, all of the curators at the museum uh, decided to pick different senses to talk about and sort of a symposium that we had to, to open up that exhibition. And so um, I got sent, <laughs> the scent, sense, um, smell, and I was trying to figure out how on earth uh, with books I would talk about smell. I was thinking, well, an incense burner or something would make a lot more sense for smell. But actually, once I started digging into it and thinking about all the different smells of books, it was actually a fun topic. And it was something I never had uh, explored before, but um, it was really fun, actually. So. Any other questions? I see a lot of comments, but I'm not sure if there are more questions in there. Uh, let's see. Oh, what are the book boxes used for storage made of? So we've actually gone to sort of a, a very, um, simple cardboard uh, boxes. We, we actually, there, there have been several different types over the, the years. Um, and some of them now we know that they aren't um, so acid free, like early ones that were made for books in the earlier um, history of our collection. So like books boxes from the thirties, for instance, are actually not good for the books. Um, they, they contain things that are actually harmful. Um, so we have a specific type of um, like a cardboard, um, uh, boxes that we use that we make um, usually in-house um, but they are you know sort of conservation grade you know they're very specific types um, If any other questions? I'm looking at the questions to see if there's any others popping up that I can answer. Oh, how can you get rid of cigarette smell in a book? Um, so I'm not a conservator, uh, so I'm not sure the answer to that. I imagine it'd be pretty, actually pretty hard to, to um, get out. It would probably take time and, um, uh, but there are um, conservators who you could consult to see if there's a way to sort of minimize the the smell. Um, I 
or find that ink in part smell? It's a good question. I mean, ink can have its own smell. Um, and my understanding is that um, part of what you're smelling when the book is breaking down, like printed books are breaking down, is, is a combination of the paper, the ink, the leather, um, the glue, all of those things. Um, so I imagine that the ink is part of that, that smell that you're getting. Um, I don't, I can't think of a specific instance where, you know, the ink, the ink itself was what I was smelling in a book. Um, but that is a good question. And I'm sure, you know, depending on what the ink is made of, uh, you, you might have a specific smell to it. I mean, I'm thinking about when I was in college, I, I did some printing and the, the ink that we printed with um, definitely had a specific smell. Like I can still imagine it today. So I'm sure for some, some of the books, it would have its own smell.